Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar on inclusive design and what you should consider. I'm Natasha Watson, and I'm a structural engineer from Bureau Happold, and I'll be your chair for today. And I'm standing in for Louise, who sadly can't make it today. I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Chris Watkins, who's a senior consultant in the Access and Inclusive Environments team at Arup. We have Jane Simpson, who's an architect and director of Jane Simpson Access. We also have Lindsay Rutter, who's a structural engineer and founder of Rutter Johnson Engineering Consultancy. So like many of you on the call, um, I'm assuming, I'm relatively new to the area of inclusive design. And so I'm looking forward to learning from today's speakers. I want to know where I can influence the brief and design my buildings to be fit for purpose for all of us, from large scale flagship projects to smaller scale residential car parks and open spaces. There are certification schemes and awards for inclusive design available. There's the recently launched CIC Inclusive Environments Recognition Scheme, and also the Selwyn Goldsmith Award for Inclusive Design as part of the Civic Trust Awards. Um, Jane Simpson, one of our speakers, is actually judging um, for the Selwyn Goldsmith Award tomorrow. Um, this award has been going since uh, 2011 and is named after Selwyn Goldsmith, who wrote the influential text, Designing for the Disabled, all the way back in 1963. Today, inclusive design covers visible and invisible disabilities, but also wider issues such as race, gender, sexual orientation and socioeconomic status. These topics influence us as designers, but also as employees and employers. Please see the ROBA's inclusion chart inclusion charter for further information and for guidance on how you can make a change uh, in the construction industry today. Finally, inclusive design should not be seen as a nice to have or an over and above. Designing for us all as individuals will ensure that our buildings and our urban fabric are far more widely used and foster community and will be fit for purpose in the future with minimal modifications. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Chris Watkins, um, who will be presenting on what inclusive design means further. Welcome, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can see my, my screen now. Um, indeed, my name is Chris Watkins. Um, I'm one of the senior consultants within Arup's Access and Inclusive Environments team. Uh, so don't worry, I'm not going to give you a full sales pitch, but just to say that that means that inclusive design and access is very much my day job, uh, normally working as an access specialist as part of design teams on really a whole range of projects. So lots lots of residential and commercial buildings, um, and but then down to the level of retail fit outs, uh, lots of transport infrastructure, train stations, sports venues. Um, and I get teased within our team that I seem to specialize in multi-story car parks at the moment. So a, a wide range of experience in different projects from, from your, your very big and glamorous to your much more practical things that actually just get used by real people every day. That's enough about me. Um, I should warn you, I'm, I'm going to start a little bit ab abstract today um, by thinking about what we mean by inclusive design, what inclusive design is, where it comes from, um, for considering really who we're designing for and then commenting on some of the, the key factors that I think are, are central in, in enabling us to design inclusively. Um, before handing over to Jane, who will give her architect's perspective with some, some really practical examples of what inclusive design um, can mean to you as structural engineers. So if you're, if you're sitting there for the first couple of minutes thinking this is all very well, but what does it mean in practice? I promise that is coming. So do, do bear with me. So what is inclusive design? Well, the BSI gives us this definition I'm showing on screen. It's the design of products and services that are usable by as many people as reasonably possible. And that's fine, um, but I think it's, it's useful to pull that apart a bit and consider where it comes from and, and really where this idea of inclusive design comes from um, is the idea of, of the social model of disability which which I like to, to keep bearing in mind this is this is the idea that essentially um, inequality is is created not by someone's own characteristics um, not by someone's uh, own bodies but by society and in our case the built environment around them or to put that in potentially more challenging terms, it basically idea, the idea that a wheelchair user is, is not so much disadvantaged by the fact they can't walk, but by the fact that there's steps everywhere. Um, and as a common thought experiment, um, in a world where absolutely everybody used a wheelchair, 
and everything is designed by people using wheelchairs, things would look very different. We wouldn't we wouldn't have staircases, quite frankly. Indeed, the two percent of us us unwieldy people who insisted on wandering around on on funny, fleshy, wobbly leg things would be hugely disadvantaged by the built environment because all the ceilings would be five foot high and uh, there wouldn't be anywhere to sit down. And believe you me, as someone who recently tried to furnish a flat with a wheelchair user, I have to fight for my rights as a non-disabled person to get a comfortable sofa. So this is far from a perfect model, but I think what's important, what, what it does do is it brings that inequality and unfairness, I suppose, um, firmly within our control. It's the same concept really as, as the hopefully now uncontroversial idea that while it's completely true for example, that women earn less than men and are, in, are much less likely to be in positions of power in, in business and in government, for example. That's that's not because there's something wrong with women. It's because we live in a society which for thousands of years has predominantly been designed by men, for which I apologise. So inclusive design is in that sense, not about doing something extra. It's not about adding something in to make our designs more inclusive. It's about being cognizant of what we're already doing that can and does disadvantage some groups. And hopefully as a result of being of, of that cognizance, changing what we do as a result. So when I talk about inclusive design, I'm, I mean this, I'm, I mean just principles of good design. Design should be equitable in use, allowing everyone to not necessarily do things the same way, not necessarily have exactly the same experience, not requiring everyone to behave in the same way, but an experience of the same quality, regardless of someone's personal circumstances. It should be leg legible and intuitive to use, allowing people to use a space product or service independently. It's about making things easy, not just for your standard user, but for the whole variety of people who will use um, what it, whatever it is we're, we're designing. But perhaps most importantly, inclusive design for me is about offering choice and flexibility. And, and there's, there's really three three aspects of this I'd like, I'd like to touch on. Firstly, everyone is different and allowing people choice in how they achieve what they do accommodates that difference. You can't design a, a single version of something which is going to be accessible and usable by absolutely everybody because everybody has slightly different requirements around what they need. On top of that as well, what people, what we all need changes over our lifetime. Um, our, our bodies change through our life. Um, and certainly if you're thinking with regards to, to private homes, what we need right now might be very different if that from what we might need if we're expecting to live in a home for 30 years. Um, I am like to think that I still qualify as young, but I can still list, I won't list, but I can still list ways in which my physical needs are different to what they were when I was um, younger and fitter and, and 18 years old. And finally, building on that, we're living in a very changing world. So I'm putting some statistics on screen, touching on some of these global trends. What I will say is that Disability statistics aren't notoriously unreliable as definitions can vary and often the definitions we use would, would include people within that category who wouldn't use that that word to describe themselves necessarily. Um, but the number I got on screen is, is the scope estimate of 9.4% of the UK population being disabled. Um, I think last time I checked the DWP uh, use I think 19 or 20 percent of the UK population falling within the Equality Act definition of, of disability. You can have a huge argument over these statistics and how useful they are. I think, I think the point is um, there's quite a lot of it about it might be more prevalent than we than we might first think. We're also getting older as a population. Um, right now or last year 18% of the UK population are, are over 65 and, and that percentage is, is, is looks to be only set to to increase and on the other end of the scale 19% of the population in the UK are under the age of 16 and I think we can we can forget that actually we, we spend 20% of our lives as children um, and normally that means that when we were children we had we we, we, we were different shape and size and our needs were different to how we how we are today um, and then finally the, the bottom three statistics I won't read them all out but I think it's worth saying we've we've got an improving global understanding of neurodiversity and mental health and well-being 
across the world really and I think quite a significant change within the last decade and that might not be the first thing that comes to mind when you consider access and inclusive design but it's really it's, it's absolutely the case that these are physical characteristics that, that influence how someone uses a spatial product and therefore need to be considered. Partly because of this fast changing world and the changing nature of, of what it means to be a human being that essentially the, following the basic minimum requirements of code and legislation will, will only take us so far. Um, these standards, these codes, they, they tend to be based on, on average characteristics of a whole group of people. In many cases, I see possibly even in most cases, based on research often carried out before I was born. Um, it's it's as, as, as soon as any research is published, it is going to be out of date. And as a result, can fail to consider the changing nature of our of our little species and the way we do things, um, the use of technology in particular, and the things that we want from our built environment. They also can fail to, to recognize how different spaces to use. We, we can't do inclusive design by numbers. Um, if, you, if you go by um, approved document M of the building regulations, you've got 150 page documents that covers um, residential projects, covers dwellings, and you've got another 50 page document that covers literally everything else. Um, if you think about the, the variety of what we design and build, you're never going to be able to cover that in detail um, and consider every, every situation within, within those 50 pages, including drawings. So all projects, whether we like it or not, end up somewhere, falling somewhere on this, this scale um, I'm showing on screens. So that's from reactive to regulatory to proactive to leading. Even if inclusive design isn't thought about at all on a project, um, these are still issues that will need to be dealt with at some point um, in a reactive and, and at that point potentially quite expensive and, and not very nice way. Um, as all employers, service providers and landlords have, have got duties under the Equality Act to, to remove or mitigate barriers for individuals. I'm not gonna talk a huge amount about that now, but I'm, I'm happy to explain more about how that works um, in the Q&A. The next one up is that regulatory one. So allowing inclusive design to be driven by processes like building control, like planning policy, um, that does it comply with part M question. This is really important in establishing a basic standard that as, as we've just been talking about, can only go so far. The pro proactive is about uh, using this, this increasing and, and quite high quality body of guidance that is already out there. Um, most noticeably BSA 300, the British standard, um, as well as sector specific guidance. So certainly anything, for example, in healthcare or education or rail will have its, its own set of standards and guidance, um, which are, are much, uh, much more tailored to that kind of project. Um, and as, as a whole, this, this extra guidance tends to be uh, more up to date and more detailed than just, just going by building regulations. But finally, what I really want to focus on is, is that to, be, to be really leading inclusive design, before deferring to existing guidance, we just need to really understand the people that we're designing for, because people are really complicated. The way in which someone uses a space or a product or a service or whatever it is we're designing will be impacted by, by this list and more. So people have different levels of vision, different levels of hearing, um, different different uh memory issues uh, issues on attention span as well as mobility and dexterity which might be some of the first that we we think of initially um and this exists in the context of someone's religious faith faith their cultural context gender identity sexuality socio socioeconomic backgrounds and much much more i think some of these it's are more visible than others. You are probably more likely to notice a mobility issue meeting someone. That doesn't mean you automatically notice. You're more likely to notice a mobility issue than you would necessarily know about someone's socioeconomic background, for example. Um, some of these are also more long term or even permanent and, and some are not. Um, so when we talk about uh, attention span, for example, that could be something 
could be something neurodiversity related. It, it could be that someone ha with ADHD might have a different type of attention span to someone without that without that diagnosis. Um, it could be that someone has uh, uh, long term health conditions like um, dementia or Alzheimer's, or it could be that someone is distracted because they're on their mobile phone, for example. So these are these are all different requirements which can be. Uh, which can be a, a long-term part of that individual and part of their identity or can be much, much more situ situational. But I think most importantly, the thing to consider is that absolutely none of these exist on their own. People are not just a characteristic. They are going to be a whole collection of different, different qualities, different attributes, different requirements they have. So designing for a type is always going to limit us. So before I hand back over, I just want to share my, my five key factors that enable us to design inclusively. The first one I can't emphasize enough is about knowing your users, understanding what it is they want to do, how they want to do it. And that will be different from, from person to person and it will be different from, from project to project. Secondly, I think it's it's really important to remember just how complicated people are. I still haven't worked them out on 30 something years on this planet. Um, Designing in flexibility and choice is absolutely key. One size does not and cannot fit all. Thirdly, is going back to this, this, this social model idea, which I think is, is a really useful thing to keep in our minds in that it's not, when we're talking about inclusive design, we're not just talking about adding in accessible features. We're not talking about putting in a changing places facility or a disabled loo or a gender neutral loo. Sometimes that's, that's, that's that's the headline grabbing stuff which makes it look which shows that we've quite visibly done something um, but it is at least as important to think about how we how we can remove and take out unnecessary barriers understanding that what we are designing whether we think about it or not is going to impact different groups of people differently regardless of whether we think about it with with that inclusive design lens Fourthly, um, and I, I, I know we'll be hearing more about this in a few minutes, but it is vital to incorporate inclusive design as early in a project as possible. Um, and, and Jane will be talking about what that looks like in practice. All I will say for now is that by incorporating inclusive design right at the, at the very beginning, it can be something that really adds value to the work that we do. And to be really blunt about it, not worrying about it until it becomes a problem to be overcome later in the process, you're you're fixing a problem that you've created rather than adding value for, from the outset. And then the final point for me is it's about taking responsibility. Um, inclusive design would perhaps ironically be pretty counter-inclusive if it was only the preserve of specialized specialists like me sitting in glass offices in London with the words inclusion in my job title. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone needs to know all of the answers, but I think I would really like to get to a stage where we all have inclusive designs in our mind, perhaps in the same way that we think about safety. There are some people who specialise it and where it's very much their job, but it, it is still a, an important part of everything that, that we do as designers. So that's me. I'll, I'll hand back over on that note and look forward to uh, discussing in the Q&A. No and thank you to Chris and thank you to Natasha. Um, uh, yeah, Chris has given a really good explanation of the legislation and the, um, the ethics really around inclusion. Now, I am an access consultant, but I'm also an architect um, and I've worked on inclusion for nearly three decades now. I work with design teams on a regular basis. Following on from Chris, I would just like to outline the context of the legislation, how it sits with regard to the construction industry. Explain the inclusive overlay in the plan of work, which is in there now. I should say plan of work, not works, I'm afraid I've got it wrong. And identify aspects that I think are most important for you as structural engineers to consider. Great. Um, yeah, as, as Chris has, or I want to reiterate what Chris has said. Um, note the uh, slide actually relates to the UK and specifically England. And obviously things will vary throughout the UK and the world. But I think there's kind of a very similar kind of context. I'd just like to stress that discrimination legislation does not have any technical standard attached to it. And building regulations, whilst it is statutory, is seen as a minimum 
obligation, minimum standard. And actually, ADM states within it that meeting ADM does not necessarily equate to meeting the equality legislation. So you have to be very careful if you think that you get a building rec sign off that actually everything's cracked. It's not necessarily. Now, BSA 300, you've got the British standards. You've got 9999, 991. Um, they're actually quite important, but they're still very generic. You also have sector guidance. So you have schools, um, you have Sport England, you have health building bulletin notes, you have things for transport. So what you've got to be careful of is you've got to look at all of these different elements and establish which is the, pro the most appropriate for your project and as Chris has said you've got to be careful because these documents are cyclic BS 8300 came out in 2018 or 19 um, what you have now is building regulations is likely to be updated the next sort of um, few years so just be careful of it so this is how it all sits the equality legislation has no technical standards building regulations are a minimum British standards are a generic um, mechanism and then you've also got specialist sector work. So you need to look at all of these elements to see what you need to consider. So, again, I won't say too much on disability because Chris has covered that quite well. But I will say that buildings are built with a circa, what, 25, 50 year lifespan? That's quite a long time period. Um, and we are an aging population. And with that comes a rise in disability. Uh, I think 45 is the age at which disability rises the most dramatically. I mean, I say that to architects quite often. I mean, I'm, I'm 50. 58 now so luckily at the moment i am not my husband is um as you can see um, wheelchair users in the center come in various modes as well is you know just because somebody's in a wheelchair they don't necessarily fit into your standard 800 to 1400 space etc so a little bit careful and statistics even though they can be um different in various places i think they believe there's no more than eight percent of disabled people are actually wheelchair users and RNID, for instance, estimate we have 12 million people with hearing loss. Now, that's a lot of people. And again, as with eyesight, it's a sensory, uh, the sensory loss is very much an ageing perspective. I don't want to say talk too much about that because we've already covered it. Uh, so the RBA plan of work. Um, I'll take the table on the left from the BS8300, which is, is covering a similar thing. And effectively, it is what we would, in the inclusion world, talk about the sequential journey. Sequential journey, not just through a building, but also through the um, stages of the building process. And the new RBA plan of work now includes inclusion in all stages from naught through to seven. So what does it mean for architects and for you as structural engineers supporting architects? Well, the RBA plan of work, um, key stages are probably for you, are probably stages one to five. At, at one, the client's establishing um, the design standards. And as outlined earlier, different sectors have different requirements. For instance, Sport England have wider doors than, than Part M. Now, stage two is understanding the strategic requirements. Early decisions on structure can impact on the future accessibility. So understanding key inclusion obligations may impact on your choice of structure. Stage three, design should inform building regulations, ensuring the correct spaces and locations of elements now, as any changes will impact on planning. And what we don't want to do is have to go back and amend drawings after planning's got through. Stage four is detail. And to be honest, simply it's about ensuring everything fits. Because once the FF and E goes in, does it work? It is often dimensions rather than area that counts. And structure has a role to play in this. Stage five, during construction, ensuring that inclusion is considered during any change on site. Any change should consider inclusion and accessibility. Keep it on the radar. I've done too many projects where change has been made partly due to added value and suddenly the access has been destroyed okay so what do we need to consider um as structural engineers um the next three slides i hope will answer or identify some of the aspects that you need to consider during your work and i'm hoping following this you will ask a question at any of your next design team meetings as to how what inclusion standards are applicable to projects so the sequential journey, as I've already explained, is paramount for disabled people. For arrival, I've had projects where beams to an underground car park has resulted in inaccessible landscapes and actually quite costly changes on site to ensure that people can actually get it into the buildings. Another misconception, common misconception, is the headroom in car parks, particularly at ramps and changes in level. Often disabled people drive larger, higher, higher, higher cars, vehicle cars are actually quite tall because the wheelchair user can go in the back through a ramp. The obvious one is circulation, but when considering the full diverse people, there is much more to consider. 
I belong to the UIA Architecture for All Western Europe Group 1. It's a mouthful, but until recently, we used to get together twice a year to discuss inclusion. And I can see my, uh, that, that, that gentleman there is, is Christian um, from the Netherlands. Um, he's a wheelchair user who refuses to look for the lift if it's not intuitive, as Chris mentioned earlier. Um, and he uses escalators um, rather than travel further after spending time looking for the lift. I would say he is the exception rather than the rule, but uh, disabled people can often be the exceptions and not the rule. And there's also detailed elements I'll follow through with shortly. That actually is, oh, I think that was in, I think that was in Luxembourg, that lift, if I remember rightly. Uh, lifts are absolutely key to, to getting disabled people into various places. And circulation. Corridors, building regulations actually says structure should not get into circulation routes, corridors. And in fact, ADM asks for a handrail uh, to be installed around any projections. And as you can see from this diagram from BS, that's what it's talking about. Now, if you end up having to do that in a building, the client is going to wonder why. They're going to think, why couldn't you de design that out? So no structure should go into circulation routes. So isolated columns is another one. If you imagine the gap that you've got here between the uh, column and the window area, if you're visually impaired or if you've got a guide dog, it's quite difficult. You, you, you should be blocking that over. You should not have that gap. People should not be able to sort of half walk through it. And plus, the other thing this quite clearly shows is the isolated columns and tonal contrast. If you squint at that, can you see it? Um, as Chris mentioned, we've all got varieties of disabilities. In fact, I think we say we're all disabled in some way or other. However, 95% of visually impaired people have some residual vision. So isolated columns will require additional measures to ensure that those people can actually use the spaces safely. Now, this is my favourite. Angle columns. This is a project I worked on, actually. Um, architects love them. Um, but what you have to understand is that you should protect between 2.1 metres um, to stop people walking into them. Um, BS8300 asks for 2.5 unless it's under stairs and ramps. What we actually did here was he actually put a plinth around the bottom to stop people being able to, to walk into it accidentally. It actually acts as a seat. Now, in terms of lift, just want to make a, a, a quick point. Uh, the 1100 by 1400 lift is not sufficient for some motorised wheelchair users. And a full passenger lift should always be installed in a new building, not a platform lift, despite what some of the product manufacturers might tell you. Um, and there are very clear guidelines on what the exceptions can be. In a new build, this is restricted to small inner city sites. So if you get a project where they want to put a platform lift in, check it out pretty quickly because it should be a full passenger lift. Okay, details. Um, sound enhancement, interestingly, the amount of steel work can impact on the effectiveness of these systems. So, A, if you are designing the M&E side, you will need to know very early on what kind of structure you've got because that will have an implication, particularly when you're dealing with large auditory areas. Now, balconies, there's a new BS8579, which I was involved in, which touches on the need for level access thresholds to balconies. ADM requires this for all publicly accessible balconies, and that's any common areas in apartment blocks, for instance. Um, residential, as I say, slightly um, less clear cut, but it should be achieved in category three housing, uh, honestly, wherever possible. So please check out BS 8579, because the structural components of balconies can impact on the level thresholds. Bridges. The gradients required to achieve access are such that unless you are lucky enough to be doing a river crossing with uh, no water traffic as shown on the slide, any changes in height can cause real issues. For your information, one in 60 is classed as level, one in 21 to one in 59 is a slope, one in 12 to one in 20 is a ramp, and the rest is Yorkshire. So a one in 20 ramp can only rise 500 mil before a landing. And that ramp is 10 metres long. So you can, the amount of, um, if you've got a change in level on your site or a bridge that you're dealing with, you really got to look at that very carefully, very early on. Another area to um, consider is escape cores. A 1200 mile wide staircase will not support carry down or mechanical escape equipment. Now, I'm sitting on the BRE MHCLG fire um, research programme and it has been quite easily identified that actually a 1200 wide 
staircase relates to numbers, not to the potential to evacuate disabled people. So what we have to really look at now is what width do we need to, to escape somebody safely? I think on the, um, the Twin Towers, they discovered that whilst people could pass disabled people as well on staircases, they chose not to because I think they thought it was rude. I think we've got to be um, understanding from the very early stages that a 1200 wide staircase may not be sufficient to ad adequately provide for means of escape for disabled people. Another one that I always get caught out with is fire protection steelwork. Quite often, the steelwork goes in, it looks okay, they suddenly have to fire protect it, board it out. And what happens? It then projects into your corridors, into your circulation, and your staircases. It shouldn't. So fire protection of steelwork needs to be taken into account before you're on site. And I've had it happen like that so many times. A very small one, actually, particularly on residential, possibly some other buildings. There's also things like bathrooms. Um, we need to be sure, we need to future-proof housing so that walls and ceilings can support grab rails and hoists. Now, that can be the, the structural elements. So please think about that, particularly when you're dealing with um, homes where people may want to live in them for the rest of their lives. Now, I've, hopefully I've gained a little bit of time back. Um, all I want to say to you now is, I would encourage you all to consider it from day one. And as, an, as structural engineers, you can have a huge impact on inclusion. And you may need to have conversations with architects a lot sooner than people possibly would have thought before. I uh, just quickly run through a project which is now completed <clears throat> and it relates to an existing building uh, built in the 1840s. It's a grade two listed building. Um, it's St Paul's Community Centre, Halliwell Road in Bolton. Uh, background is it, it was built as a group of buildings. Uh, they were constructed 1846 to 1856 by a local uh, philanthropist. And the group of buildings themselves, which are church, uh, parish centre, the original Sunday school and the almshouses are at the centre of the local con uh, conservation area. And we were asked initially to um, access the community centre building with a view to repairing what was a very degraded timber floor. It's a typical suspended timber floor, and that in itself had become decayed with wet and dry rot. Uh, at that time, the building was just a large open space. It had been a Sunday school in its original format. Uh, there was a small uh, area that was used as a kitchen at ground floor level, and there was a small office at the upper level. If I just flirt through. So that, that was the existing building. Um, access off the street at the front via some steps. A 1960s extension to form some toilets at the back because there were no toilet facilities within the building. A very rickety timber staircase leading up to a very small first floor office. The results of our initial investigation showed that the timber floor was really degraded. There were lots of uh, movement cracks in the walls, damp, typical of this type of, of building. However, the building had a listing, it was grade two listed, and the church had no money. Uh, so it was decided that we would apply for funding and bearing in mind this took from 2012 to 2016, we had to put a case together to create a community hall which was available for all users. And that said, uh, this, this, this uh, really was a challenge because we were constrained by the existing building. We needed to do the repairs. We needed to be able to get people in and out and to use the hall and also provide facilities for other events. So after a number of iterations, it was decided that we would take part of the hall and introduce a mezzanine floor which was 
at similar level to the existing first floor office. The office, uh, we ended up actually having to take the floor out because we found further rot. Uh, so there was additional cost there, but we, we managed then to make it a level access through. And taking on board Jane's comments about platform lifts, we did actually install a platform lift uh, that was suitable for the larger motorised wheelchairs. And we went through great pains to, to uh, select the correct lift in that instance. Um, the, simp the structure itself is as simple as possible. It's a series of beams built into the external walls with uh, square hollow section columns, which were within the confines of the, uh, the walls, either block work or studded walls. So there was limiting or no projections in most cases. Um, we did have a number of issues with the fire officer in terms of means of escape. And at one point we had proposed to take out this window to create an, ex, uh, an additional fire escape from the hall. Uh, unfortunately, the listed building officer was not um, in favour of that. So we had to uh, revisit the, the, the fire escape situation. In doing uh, the upper floor, we created a meeting room, we created offices, and we created a compartmentation refuge where escape, uh, where people could, could um, escape to and be, es be evacuated from in the event of a fire. This has a link through to the main fire alarm panel. And it was uh, quite a, a series of meetings with the local fire officer in order to get his approval to it. Um, going back to access, which obviously it was key, we needed to create a ramped access. And that posed the greatest difficulty because of the nature of the listing of the building. The building and the external perimeter stone wall was part of the listing and the listed building officer did not want to change the arrangements which in fact were three steps from the pavement, it's a sloping pavement, three steps up on a further step into the uh, main entrance. Um, obviously the first port of call was to, and if I zip back through the slides the first port of call was to see if there was a potential to get an access at the rear unfortunately the road along the eastern side vicarage lane is an unadopted rough surface road it is totally incompatible with anybody uh, who has difficulty walking or is using wheelchairs or prams and buggies so that was completely out of the question uh, we had to fight considerably with um, the listings officer and eventually with a lot of um, lobbying and we got the support of the local history society, we were able to produce a scheme that was acceptable. The uh, new opening was formed onto a landing and we managed to get a gradient, a, a graded ramp to an area there just sufficient to get the standard wheelchair. And I have to say that was very much uh, a, a difficulty. We had to splay um, areas uh, to, to, to provide that. But in the end, uh, we managed to get it inside the building because it was multi-use we created a disabled uh, or an accessible toilet with baby changing rooms, normal toilets, bearing in mind there were no toilets previously other than in the external area, uh, and a kitchen that could be used for group work, including a lowered area, an accessible worktop and sink area clear underneath to provide uh, access to all. Uh, I'd just like to say one thing, and uh, being well over 65 and the ageing population, um, I was brought up in the time when, to some extent, engineers thought 
designing for the disabled or designing with uh, access ramps, etc., uh, was was perhaps not the the right thing to be doing. It was always seen as being a bit of a pain, and I say that quite frankly uh, because that was the sort of uh, when I was in the drawing office that was um, many many people's feelings. But having um, had to be involved in, because my wife was uh, diagnosed with multi-neuron disease in 2016 and became a fully reliant wheelchair user, the standards that the uh, building regulations, that Jane says, are very much minimum standards, particularly when you're a 16-stone bloke and have to uh, deal with wheelchairs. And one particular instance is when you go to the local supermarket and they have these clip-on trolleys on the front of a wheelchair, it's like pushing a juggernaut through the narrow aisles and the crowds of people. And uh, that's my presentation complete. There is one question here from from the audience. Uh, could we please repeat the ranges for the levels, slopes and ramps, please? I think that's... Um, more for sort of accessibility i think that's from jane's um, yeah. presentation yeah sure um what there is actually there's a requirement one thing i didn't mention actually was requirement where there is any slope any 500 changing level that's a ramp or a slope you should have a landing bear in mind this is to the front entrance to buildings under building regulations but this is also recommended in bs8 300 part one what you then have is um level is one in 60 or less um, a slope is one in 21 to one in 59 and a ramp is one in 12 to one in 20. okay was that clear enough as i said the rest of it yorkshire <laughs> cool i think that has answered that question um right so i have a question for chris um, I really liked your narrative of it's not something wrong with the individual, it's the fact that the environment has something wrong with it, um, which I think is a, a very definite mindset shift. Um, how much of your work is changing designers' mindsets um, and tackling uh, their unconscious biases, would you say? That's a really good question. I mean, I think my my starting point is that I, I really struggle to think of a designer who I've met who genuinely goes, I don't care about this at all. Um, and and I, I don't think it's the case that people want to build inaccessible things. Um, so in that sense, I think that's, that's not so much mindset change. I think the mindset change is about really understanding what that means. And in particular, that, that, that doesn't just mean, that doesn't just mean one thing. Um, and that doesn't, necessarily mean uh, something that might have worked 10 years ago, by which I mean, um, I'm very conscious that a lot of what we're talking about here is in the scheme of things really very, very new. I mean, the first disability equality legislation in this country came into force 25 years ago. That's that's within all of our lifetimes, I'm, I'm guessing. Um, it is. It has, it has always been worded in a way where it's uh, talks about um, reasonableness, for example, which is a very loose term and changes over time. Um, and as Jane was saying, standards are cyclical. They change really every few years. So the mindset change that I, have, that, that I think we might come across is not so much convincing people that it's important, but convincing people that actually what is what is good enough is constantly improving it's it's a raising it's a raising bar and i think that's that's the thing that is that is the more challenging thing to communicate sometimes okay thank you very much um jane i have a question for you um you shared with us a lot of pragmatic tips uh for design um do you have any pragmatic tips for starting the conversation with the client and the project team about accessibility from day one um, I would say that it, it's it's important to talk to the clients about understanding what they do, who they do it for, and where they do it. Because until you understand that, you don't understand the necessary levels of inclusion. And it's most clients are quite receptive, particularly when you talk about the added value. But you also have to sometimes use the stick 
Um, yeah. <laughs> the more I always bring in sustainability because there's no point building a building, as Chris said, that you've got to change within five years. What you should be looking at is, is discussing it from day one. It's cheaper to build in access from day one. So get them to understand that understanding their obligations and setting design standards at a very early stage will help help that process. I just want to add something to the last question, actually. Yeah. I got asked by a 17-year-old when I was doing a lecture the day, what was I most um, proud of in my career? And I said, I worked on an energy for waste plant, would you believe? And the contractor on site, the tonal contrast was superb. I walked around and he went, I worked with you in Rotherham on a school. I've never forgotten. <laughs> for me, that's what's important is, is, you know, a lot of people I work with are repeat clients because we work well together. They understand it. They listen. They know that if you deal with it early, it, it, it is far easier to do and less costly. Simple as that. Really. I hope that answers the question. Oh, definitely. Thank you. Um, and now finally, a, uh, a question for Lindsay. Um, from your experience with um, the listed building and the rules and the regulations, do you believe that there will be changes uh, for rules for listed buildings to allow for more inclusive design? Uh, well, I think there needs to be. I, I think <laughs> ov obviously uh, planning officers and listed building officers vary from authority to authority. And we had one who at the time uh, considered that even drilling a hole in the stonework to erect a plaque was uh, needed listed building consent. And so you were battling royal to start with. Uh, I think there needs to be more understanding. And I have to say the local history society were so much behind us and lobbied hard because what we were intending to do was to bring the building back into use, to give it a new lease of life, to make it part of the community. Otherwise, if we hadn't got uh, the funding, if we hadn't done the project, the building would eventually have gone to rack and ruin. And um, it, it, with it being part of the sort of local conservation area as well, we had a lot of local support. And, and that lobbying uh, was, was very, very relevant in, in getting consent at the end of the day. Um, we've had a question uh, through as well. I, th I believe this is for you, Lindsay. Um, are there any alternatives you find useful to building a compliant ramp to the front of listed buildings? Um, well, you've got to provide access and uh, each situation needs to be carefully considered. The, 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 the access and having you been involved in using wheelchairs, as Jane says, the standards that you see are very much minimum. Uh, I don't think you can get away with using ramps. Now, I know on a lot of church buildings, they have timber ramps that need to be brought out if somebody comes along in a wheelchair. That's not really the ideal because you need somebody who's able-bodied to be able to put the ramp in position, et cetera, et cetera. So it, in my opinion, each building, whether it's listed or not, really should have accessibility. And uh, yes, I think legislation needs to change. Um, I'm working on Manchester Town Hall refurb, which is fascinating. I mean, it's a really ancient building. Mm. And one of the, the tactics they've used is to create a new uh, level entry and stepped entry by covering what's there, but not destroying it. Mm -hmm. so it's actually just that, so it remains below. So it's not been destroyed. So in the future, if they really wanted to, they could take it out. Mm. I mean, if we all end up with hover chairs, we won't need you know, zoom up, and I think it is it is about who is is involved in it, and some local authority heritage officers. And I spent a year as one, so I could probably have a go. Um, <laughs> less um, supportive than actually English heritage. And I think what you've got to do is get the right people involved. So you you know, if you get a good access consultant, if you get a good historic you know a heritage person, do a, a do have an understanding of. Um, what is uh, sacrosanct, you know, get us a, a survey, there's a name for the survey, where they basically you understand which bit is really, really existing, and which bit was, you know, burnt down in the 50s and a new floor put in. A lot of it's about understanding the borough charter, about understanding what is touchable and what isn't. And I'll shut up now, because I do like talking. It's all very useful stuff, so, yeah. 
Um, right, okay, so um, I'd like to end the Q&A session with um, asking this question of uh, the three of you. Um, let's start with Chris. If you could change one thing tomorrow to make the built environment more inclusive, what would it be? Mm -hmm. If I was king for a day, um, I yeah. think my slightly draconian sounding tongue in cheek answer would be, um, I, would, I would ban any designer, architect or manufacturer from simply describing their design or their product as being accessible, because I think that on its on its own, that doesn't mean anything at all. So I, I would I would ban the use of that word and that concept in order to force people to think about and describe who it is accessible to and how they would use it and hopefully therefore trigger much more of a thought process about about the people at, at the end. So like a um, accessibility version of greenwashing yeah absolutely i mean i i i, I tell people sometimes that ten, t telling me as an access consultant that something is accessible is a bit like telling a fire engineer that something is fireproof um or a structural engineer that something's really really strong on, <laughs> on its own it doesn't tell you much and it just makes you worried that it hasn't really been thought about that much cool thank you very much um jane uh same I think, question to you. I think for me, it's about respect. I think that we know that one in four people have a disabled relative or friend. And what people have to understand is that it's about allowing people that the dignity to be able to um, go about their day without having to ask for support and independence. Respect and independence for me is the two keys. If people get that, then they should be able to design effectively. Fab. Um, and then, yes, finishing with Lindsay, what's uh, what's your answer? If well, you're King Fruit, I, I think I think one one thing that really sticks in my mind is the disabled car parking that you find in most sort of supermarket layouts, hospitals, etc. Particularly if you are using a, a rear ramped vehicle where you have to unload the wheelchair because by the time you've parked in the bay, you've got the yellow strip at the back. The ramp extends beyond the strip, so you're actually discharging into the traffic flow. And I, I find that um, uh, very, very difficult, particularly in busy areas. So I think that's something that really needs to be looked at. And, and a, a wheelchair bay or wheelchair dis discharge bay would be far more beneficial. Can I just add that at the back of the BS8300 Part 1, there is some quite old guidance but on distances needed for it. So. Mm -hmm. I would always encourage larger um, sites such as hospitals, et cetera, and supermarkets to have the potential for a bay. The difficulty is you can't say, you can't go in that, somebody else has to. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. There, is that, there is some advice around, and I'm sure that the changes that come through building regulations might hopefully pick that up. So when the consultation comes out, everybody get in there <laughs> and tell them to do it. All right, um, so thank you very much. Um, I think it's just up to me now to uh, do a final uh, roundup of, uh, of the talk. So thank you, Chris, for challenging our mindsets and making sure that we take responsibility for our designs. Thank you, Jane, for giving us the approaches for design and teaching us also to keep an eye on change control to make sure that inclusive design measures are not value engineered out. And thank you, Lindsay, for sharing your experience um, with the tricky balance of making listed buildings accessible. Um, accompanying this webinar, um, if you clicked on the website, there were a couple of related documents um, underneath. So please have a read of that, um, including uh, there's an article um, called isn't it time we embrace inclusive design by Sabina de Jesus, I believe. So that's from the, uh, the structural engineer um, uh, um, Structural Engineer Journal um, issued on the 16th of November. 